Welcome everyone to worship here at Mount Calvary. I'm Pastor Beechler, and it's the last weekend of January. And we are here to talk about hope, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews chapter six states, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And I pray that as you go through this time of worship that you will understand once again, the hope that Jesus has given you. Let us pray. Lord God, meet us here in this time of worship. Let us focus upon you and your gifts and what you've done for us and give back to you praise and adoration and worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of mine own I claim, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, on other ground to sink in sin. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground to sink in sand, all other ground to sink in sand. His oath is covenant and blood, support me in the raging flood. When every earthly prop gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, All other ground to sinking sand, All other ground to sinking sand. When He shall call with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, brought in his righteousness alone, redeemed to stand before his throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, on other ground to sink in sand, on other ground to We begin this time of celebration in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We take a moment of silent confession before our God. Let us now confess our sins and failures to God our Father. We confess before you, O God, that we are sinners, sinful from birth. We have sinned in our thoughts, words, and actions. We have not loved you with all our heart and soul and mind, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Hear now the good news. Through Jesus, God has lavished upon us his grace. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You have been forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As part of a loved community of mercy and grace, we encourage you now to extend that mercy to one another, to those sitting with you or those online, with the peace of the Lord. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control 
in the middle of the war. You guide my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the soul. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet Between the black skies and my red eyes I can barely see And when I'm feeling like I've been let down by my friends and my family I can feel the rain reminding me In the eye of the storm you remain in control in the middle of the war you guide my soul you alone are the anchor when my sails are torn your love surrounds me in the eye of the soul When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I picture slowly fade away. And when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring out my face, I feel my peace in Jesus' name in the eye of the soul. You remain in control in the middle of the war. You guide my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. time of Jesus' birth, there was a man named Simeon who followed God closely and devoted himself to God's ways. He knew of God's promise to one day send a Messiah to rescue Israel, and he waited and hoped for this to happen. God's Spirit revealed to Simeon that he would not die before he saw the Messiah himself. Simeon was moved by what God's Spirit told him, so he went to the temple. As he stood in the outer courts of the temple, he saw Joseph and Mary bring their young child, Jesus, into the temple. They were there to offer a sacrifice, a pair of doves or pigeons, in order to consecrate Jesus to God. Simeon took the child into his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Mary and Joseph marveled over what Simeon said about their young child. Finally, Simeon blessed Mary and Joseph as well. Just as God had promised to him, Simeon had seen the Messiah with his own eyes. Our scripture readings this week are about hope. Our first lesson's from Hebrews chapter six. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by something greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what he promised he confirmed it with an oath God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is possible for God to lie 
we would have fled to take hold of the hope set before us and may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary beyond the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf and he has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Our gospel lesson for this day is also a message of hope. It is from the Christmas story, Luke chapter two. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angel left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. This is the gospel of our Lord. We now make our confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we continue our sermon series on what we are to be, and today is we are to be people of hope, that I can cope with Jesus' hope. And often we don't realize the importance of hope in our lives. Uh, take a look at this uh, young man getting this award. His name was James B. Stockdale. And he was one of the first pilots shot down during the Vietnam War. And he spent seven years as a POW. And often during those seven years, he was tortured to renounce the United States of America. Uh, quite often he was chained with his hands above his head, couldn't even squat a mosquito for days at a time. Uh, his leg was broken and not set right. Those seven years as a POW left him disabled. How can he survive seven years long years of being a POW and being tortured. He survived because of one word, and that word is hope. He had hope that one day it would all end. He had hope that one day he'd be going home. Hope that one day he'd be hugged by his family again. Hope that God was with him. What made him survive was hope. And James Stockdale saw people without hope other men who were POWs. And some of them were not tortured. Some of them were in pretty good shape, but they just up and died. And why they die? Because they gave up all hope. Hope is very, very important to our lives. And so here's our key question for today. How do I deal with the hardships and struggles of life? And life is difficult. And look at our key idea. I can cope with the hardships of life because of the hope I have in Jesus Christ. And that leads to our theme verse from the book of Hebrews chapter 6. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. This hope is Jesus Christ. And he can give us hope in every and all situations. So let's get into our uh, message for today. And the first idea is this. We all need hope in our lives. Ephesians chapter one, I pray that the eyes of your heart 
may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. God wants you to know that you have hope, hope in every and all situations. And that's what one man discovered after a while. His name was Job. He's from the book of Job. And Job was a situation that seemed hopeless. He had lost everything. All of his children were killed. Everything he owned was robbed. Even his health was taken away from him. Job felt many days hopeless. And he was very honest with God in Job chapter 7. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they come to an end without hope. Remember, O God, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. And then to make things worse, his wife told him these words. You are still maintaining your integrity. Curse God and die. He had a group of friends that accused him of doing something wrong, that God was punishing him, and he was an innocent man. How could he find hope? He found hope in God. And he survived this terrible ordeal in his life because God was his anchor. And he wrote these words that some of you know, words of hope. I know that my Redeemer lives. In the end, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. We need this anchor of hope in our lives. And if you're a sailor, you know that nobody with a half a brain will go out in a boat without an anchor. Even the largest ships that sail this ocean, they all have anchors. They don't depend upon the crew and the captain, the engines, the compass, or the steering gear. When things go wrong, they depend upon that anchor. When all else has failed, there's hope in the anchor. And so it is with your life. There's an anchor that can give you hope in every and all situation. And that anchor is Jesus. And we need to understand that there are false anchors out there, anchors that do not work in the storm that are not this hope that we are talking about. And many people have put their hope, false hope, in their money. Uh, Timothy wrote in 1 Timothy 6, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. And it reminds me of a Bible study I taught many years ago, one of my favorite Bible studies, entitled, When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box. And this Bible study was named after James Dobson's grandmother. Uh, some of you know who James Dobson is. And James Dobson's grandmother used to tell him, when the game is over, it all goes back in the box. And she would say this because her and a little James Dobson used to play Monopoly together. And Dobson said that his grandmother was a wonderful person. She raised six children. She was a widow at this time. She lived in their house for many, many years. She was a lovely woman. But Dobson said this about his grandmother. She was the most ruthless Monopoly player he had ever known. She understood Monopoly. That it's a game of acquiring property. And when he would play or as a little kid, he would collect money and she would collect the property. Everything she earned would go towards buying more and more property in the game of Monopoly until she would become the master of the board. And he would remember time after time, near the end of the game, suddenly all his money would go to her. And eventually she would take his last dollar and he would quit in utter defeat. And she would say the same words. One day, James, you'll learn to play the game. And he hated when she said that to him. One day, you'll learn to play the game. And then one summer, he did learn with a friend of his. They spent all summer long playing Monopoly for hours. And he learned the key to Monopoly is acquiring property. That that was how you win. 
And then at the end of the summer, he played his ruthless grandmother one last time. And he was going to win. And he sat down with her to play the game. And slowly and cunningly, he exposed his grandmother's vulnerabilities. Relentlessly, he drove her off the board. The game does strange things to you, he said. I can still remember it happened on Marvin Gardens. I looked at my grandmother. She taught me how to play the game, but she was an old lady by now, and she was still a widow. And she had raised my mom, and she had loved my mom, and she loved me. But I took everything she had. I destroyed her financially and psychologically. I watched her give her last dollar and quit in utter defeat. It was the greatest moment in my life. But then she had one more thing to teach me. And she said, now it all goes back in the box. All the houses, hotels, all the railroads, utility companies, all the property, all that wonderful money now goes back in the box. The game is over. And she said, none of it was really ours. We got all heated up about it for a while. But it was around a long time before we sat down to play the game. It'll be around a long time after we're gone. Players come and players go. It all goes back in the box. The game had ended. And someday the game will end for all of us here today. And when that game ends, guess what happens to all your stuff? It all goes back in the box. It is temporary. There is no real hope in our possessions, and in our money. Uh, John Ortberg said this, you have to ask yourself, when you finally get to the ultimate possession, when you've made the ultimate purchase, when you bought the ultimate home, when you've stored up financial security and climbed the ladder of success to the highest ring you can possibly climb it, and the thrill wears off, and it will wear off, then what? It all goes back in the box. Maybe... Just maybe, hope is not found in our possessions. And so we look then for hope in people. These people, they're going to be around forever. They're going to lead me in the right direction. But Psalm 146 states, Don't put your trust in princes and in human beings who cannot save. And I read this week something very sad that happened in the World War II. The Allies would come into some small towns in Germany. And as they came to these defeated towns, as the war ended, they discovered lots of people had killed themselves. And they thought, how sad, they had survived the entire war, and they put an end to their life. They died because they were without their hope. They had put their hope in the Nazis, put their hope in Hitler, and Hitler had disappointed them. Hitler had ruined their nation and ruined this world. They had put their hope in the wrong person. And so don't put all your hope in people. People are faulty and people make mistakes. Only God deserves your eternal hope. And then the Bible says, don't put your hope in idols. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teacher lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation, he makes idols that cannot speak. And some of you put your hope in these idols. The idols of power, approval, comfort, possessions, success, and fame, and pleasure. All these idols will eventually disappoint you because they will all fail you someday. And then there's one that might shock you, and that is human government. That sometimes we too much hope in government. And we should bless our nation and pray for our nation, but don't put all your hope in government. Uh, the people of God did this a long time ago in the Old Testament through their hope in the government of Egypt to rescue them. And Isaiah said, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help who rely upon their horses. Human governments will eventually collapse and fail us. That's what happened to Babylon. This is a, a picture of how beautiful and mighty Babylon was, the capital of the Babylonian Empire. God, through the prophets, said one day, This big, beautiful capital will fall, and it will be a place where jackals and owls hang out. And nobody believed. Now, how could this big, beautiful capital disappear? Well, it did. This is Babylon today. 
where creatures and jackals fill their houses where owls dwell. Don't put all your hope in human government. And so all these things are dead ends when it comes to real eternal hope. Wealth, idols, people, governments, they're not a place to put your eternal hope in. Where we put our hope is in Jesus. I love what the psalm writer said, Psalm 42. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You see, in Jesus we have eternal hope and hope in his promises. And that's what God's people have done for thousands of years. They've trusted and put their hope in the promises of God. It goes back to Father Abraham, the founder of the Jewish faith. One day God told Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and I will bless you and bless those who bless you. And he said, I will give you as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. And then Abraham waited year after year after year for a child. But he waited in hope. He trusted in the promises of God. And one day, the promise came true. Abram had a little child, and this child had kids, and those kids had kids, and those kids had kids, until there are many descendants from Abraham as there are stars in the sky. God had kept his promise. Another time, when Abram still just had one child, he was asked to sacrifice that child. And on the way to the mountain of the sacrifice, that child whose name was Isaac said this, Father, the wood and the fire are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. In the midst of things he did not understand, he trusted in the promises of God. And again, God came through. When it, time for the sacrifice came, an angel said, look over there, Abraham, there's the lamb for the sacrifice. And there was a ram caught in a thicket. And this ram became the sacrifice for Father Abraham. Again, God kept his promises. And so we live with these promises that Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. That when we call, he will answer. When we open our hearts, he will enter. If we'll be his child, he'll be our God. He will love us and be our friend. I will come to you. I will abide in you. I will walk with you. I will talk with you. I will direct your paths. I will always be with you. I'll be your savior and your friend. These are the promises we rest our lives on. Promises that last forever. And most importantly, the big promise that gives us big hope. And that promise is found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And God kept that promise. Hundreds of years later, the promise came true on Christmas, a promise that is the anchor of our hope. And you know this promise is from the Christmas story. The angels show up to a group of shepherds and say, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, which is Bethlehem, a savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And I learned something really cool. And if you're not paying attention right now, come back, uh, stop looking out the window, pay attention to this. This is really, really cool stuff. That there is a cool prophecy there. A baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. That those shepherds saw something in there that we have not seen. You see, Bethlehem was unique. Beside being the birthplace of Jesus, it was the place where most of the lambs were born for the temple sacrifice. The hills around Bethlehem were hundreds of lambs used for worship in the temple as sacrificial lambs. You see at the temple, twice a day, morning and evening, 
One of those lambs was sacrificed for the sins of the people. And then there were the special sacrifices of Passover and other festivals. Lambs coming from Bethlehem. And who raised those lambs? Well, according to scholars I read about, they were shepherd priests. You see, around Bethlehem were men from the tribe of Levi. They were the priests. And these Levites were also shepherds, and their job was to raise healthy, pure, unblemished lambs for the sacrifice, as talked about in the book of Leviticus. And so in that Christmas story, now it takes on an interesting idea that those angels are coming to the shepherd priests who are raising the sacrificial lambs. And then it gets even more interesting. Let me read you this quote. It's important that the lambs that were sacrificed did not have any blemishes, broken leg or injuries. After the lamb was born, it was wrapped in swaddling clothes, like the baby Jesus. Swaddling clothes from the priest's old garments to keep it protected without spot or blemish. And then that lamb was laid in a special manger to calm it down, to protect it from being trampled. And so these scholars think that when Jesus was born, he was taken to that same manger where the shepherd priests were. And he was wrapped in the swaddling clothes and laid there. And they understood the significance of who Jesus was, that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, that this little baby would grow up to be the sacrifice for our sins. And so in this Jesus, we have hope because our sins are taken away and we are now children of God and we have the hope of eternal life. I like what Alistair Begg said, all the promises of God find their yes and their amen in the Lord Jesus. And so as you draw close to Jesus, we get these beautiful fruits we've been talking about, love and joy and peace and kindness and hope. It is all found in Jesus. And so with Jesus, we are never without hope. Even death is not a hopeless situation. Even in death, there is hope. As Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So you do not grieve like the rest of mankind. You have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. Even in the most hopeless situations, we have hope because of Jesus. It reminds me of another guy, Victor Frankl. He lived in a concentration camp in World War II. And again, he saw many people die when they lost hope. He wrote, any attempt to restore a man's inner strength in the camp was first to succeed in showing him some future goal, giving them hope. And that's what Jesus is to us. In every and all situations, we have hope because we have Jesus and we have his love and we have his Holy Spirit. Again, look what Paul continued to say in 1 Thessalonians 4. According to the Lord's own word, I tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who fall asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Because of the cross and Easter, we are people of hope. We can keep going. So James Stockdale survived a terrible ordeal. And some of you right now are surviving some terrible ordeals in your lives. Be people of hope. Death is not the end. This will not continue forever. There is a God who loves us and who died for our sins and give us the hope of eternal life. So how do I deal with the hardships and struggles of life? I can cope with the hardships of life because of the hope I have in Jesus Christ. And even when all hope seems to be lost, 
we can say with hope these words of Job, I know that my Redeemer lives, Jesus, the Lamb of God. And in the end, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. So this is our anchor. This is our hope. Jesus loves us. In his name we pray. Amen. We encourage you now to stand to have a different position before God as we talk to our Father in prayer. We pray, Lord God, we thank you that in Jesus we have an anchor in our lives, that no matter what happens to us, not even death, we are people with amazing hope. Hope purchased us for us by God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for those who labor, for those whose work is difficult and dangerous, for all who travel. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for those in need, for the hungry and the homeless, for the widowed and the orphaned, for all those in prison. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the sick and the dying, for all those who are in your care. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And we pray for those who are grieving, especially those who loved and cared for Connie Clooney. We thank you for her great Bible knowledge, for her great service to you here on earth. Be with her husband, Tom, as he grieves her passing, but grieving with hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So Lord God, let us go through this week and let us pe people see that something inside of us is different, that we have hope in every and all situation because of Christ, our Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Parish announcements for this day. Uh, coming up, the first Saturday of February is the Rotary Polar Plunge. If you'd like to make a donation in my name, uh, your money will half go towards fighting polio around the world and for those in need who come to our church. Also coming up on the second week of February, where we're restarting our Awanas Junior and Senior High Youth Group and Bible studies on Wednesday nights here live. And all that is in our church website. And then the day before that, Bob will be starting the church choir and the chime choir. If you want to be part of either one of those musical teams, I'll let Bob know. Uh, finally, one thing to rejoice in. Uh, last week we got to give our local hospital staff dinner for free. Uh, our church paid for the dinner because our hospital staff is tired. They've been working very, very hard. And we wanted them to know that this church cares about all that they do. Well, it's now time to leave this time of worship and to go out into the world being the hands and feet and voice of Jesus, being hands and feet and voices of hope. So receive now God's blessings. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.